As someone with a background in science, it's always interesting to watch the breathless excitement with which some discoveries, potentially years from practical applications, are reported in the news. Probably none more so at the moment than EV and climate related news. And so it was when a paper came out that suggested that you might be able to extend the battery life of lithium ion batteries by one third by reawakening lithium deposits in the battery that traditional electrochemistry would suggest were dead. Given the recent suggestions that solid state batteries are likely to be highly supply constrained and some time away, this seems like a very promising piece of research. But is it? We'll explain what it shows and what it means for the future of technology. But first, a little reminder to hit like, subscribe and click that notification bell. And if you'd like, consider supporting us from just one dollar a month. I'll tell you how at the end of the video. In a lithium ion battery of the sort that powers most EVs, but also the cornucopia of useless gadgets that we nearly all ferry about disappointedly, capacity loss over time is some kind of a given. We talk about it in terms of aging and of degradation and pretty much every discussion of EVs on the internet will have some person who adds there to penneth about how EV batteries will only last three charges and will then be completely useless and end up in a landfill. Time has shown that none of that is true. Typically EV batteries last a long, long time, then they get used in second use projects, then the resources are recycled into new batteries. That said, and Nissan, I'm very much looking at you here, some early batteries definitely didn't have the lifespan they should have. So before we dive into the electrolyte, Let's just have a quick reminder of, very roughly, what the battery structure looks like. So there are two terminals, colloquially the positive and negative terminals, also referred to as the anode and cathode. These two can be referred to as current collectors or electrodes. I've encountered some descriptions on the internet where these two terms have been swapped during charging, so for the sake of simplicity we're going to stick with positive and negative electrode or current collectors throughout this video. Wrapped around those is the container for the battery, either a can as found in Tesla's cylindrical cell designs or pouches as are used by many other auto manufacturers and also in a lot of small appliances. In between the two current collectors is a separator which has two vital roles in the cell. One role is to prevent contact between the positive and negative electrodes which would produce a short. Incidentally, one of the two faults in the Enfuego Bolt batteries was a failure of that separator. The other role though, that makes the first job more complicated because it has to aid in the transition of ions from the positive to the negative current collectors. So it's got to get ions to pass through. Then there's the electrolyte, the goop through which these ions flow. So during charging, the ions zip from the positive electrode, the one made of lithium, to the negative electrode where they're stored. The electrons that make charging happen are, for our purposes, shoved in by the charger and the two make friends and hang out at the negative electrode. Then, when you're wanting to go somewhere, those lithium ions make their way back, slipping through the electrolyte goop and through that separator to find their way back to the lithium electrode. The electrons have to find their way back to the lithium electrodes by travelling through the controller and motor, which is what makes your car go whee! There are a variety of chemical and physical processes that underlie capacity loss, but one of the most significant has been the formation of isolated lithium islands separated from the positive electrode. What happens here is that over time the electrical field present in the battery during charging causes the formation of little tiny tendrils that stick out from the lithium current collector. Those little tendrils slowly grow, forming their spindly little lithium strands out from the electrode and eventually, as the electric field does its work, the lithium from the end attached to the electrode starts to dissolve and reform at the very tip of the tendril, which is all very fine and dandy until the end that was connected to the positive electrode completely dissolves. Then you're left with an island of isolated lithium which is just there, hanging out, having cocktails, while the rest of the battery is trying to work. Now, there's lots of things that people have tried to prevent that from happening. For example, tweaks to the separator material and structure. Researchers have made changes to the chemical composition of the electrolyte material, and they've tweaked the microscopic and larger scale structure of the current collectors. 
and those changes have definitely improved things. Early lithium batteries were certainly much shorter lived than their more modern compatriots, but that tendril formation is still an issue. Until recently, it was thought that once it detached from the electrode, this lithium was lost to the battery. Once it retired and started golfing, it wasn't going to come back to the office. But what these researchers did was build a battery where they could examine more closely what happens there and seed it with isolated islands of lithium. Now, to be technically accurate, they seeded it with lithium islands attached to little teeny copper strands to allow them to measure the potential energy from those lithium islands and also see what they were doing. But for the sake of this, they're isolated from the rest of the lithium in the pack. Looking closely at these lithium islands, the researchers noted that when charging, the lithium changed shape, becoming bulbous and pulling away from the lithium that makes up the positive electrode. And when discharging, the lithium would pull back towards that same electrode. Not only would it pull back, but it would begin to migrate back, dissolving at the end nearest the negative electrode and reforming at the end near the positive electrode, the electrode it belongs to. In other words, while the lithium is isolated and not taking part in delivering or storing energy in the battery, it is also still affected by the electric field in the battery, which means that the researchers thought it might be possible to manipulate it in such a way that it would eventually join back up to the lithium electrode, which would allow it to come out of retirement and back to the workforce, generating energy. It turns out that this stripping and reforming is closely linked to the amount of current flowing through the battery. And in tests that the researchers then performed on real non-demonstration cells, they found that yes, the process does work. Islanded lithium can be encouraged to rejoin the lithium electrode. This was achieved in nickel manganese cobalt lithium cells by utilizing a short high current discharge activation step lasting one to two minutes at the very end of charging. So you charge it right up then suck some of that stored energy back out, quickly. The current draw that appears to be the most effective compromise between using up the energy you're trying to store in the battery and making the battery's lifespan longer seems to be somewhere around three milliamps per square centimeter within the cell, which works out for the cell they were using as one C. C is a measurement of discharge rate, and one C means that if you continuously drew current at that rate, the battery would be completely discharged in one hour. So for a 100 amp hour battery, you'd be drawing 100 amps. The researchers noted that higher discharge rates did produce slightly more reforming of the electrode, but that benefit was reduced because you were using energy from the cell to do this, so taking more power from it during that reforming cycle right at the end. And that means that you have less stored energy in the battery to do actually driving around, which is what you want it for. Also, higher current draws increase something called side reactions, where the electrolyte effectively becomes less good at helping the ions to move around. Imagine some grease with grit in it. Things aren't going to move quite so smoothly. In side reactions, that grit-filled grease is smeared on the lithium electrode and hampers the flow of lithium ions. So there's definitely a sweet spot where this process works best. Now, what does this mean? Using this process, charging right to full, then discharging rapidly for a couple of minutes immediately appears to make that lithium that's gone off to retirement rejoin the workforce. And the result of that is a battery that keeps its capacity nearer its original maximum longer. And when it starts to deteriorate, it does so more slowly. I faintly wonder if this is why cars that have good thermal management and have had lots of rapid charges have held out better than expected, because the owners have almost certainly been doing a lot of long distance rapid driving. So they've been unwittingly subjecting these batteries to something akin to this process. So it looks like with tweaks to the way vehicles charge, it will be possible to significantly prolong the life and capacity of our current generation of lithium batteries. But if you think that's going to happen to your current car, because they just need to tweak the charge curve to have a discharge step. There's a fly in that ointment. Since it requires a rapid discharge step, it's unlikely that cars without some kind of method of high power bidirectional charging could be retroactively enabled. So not only is this not coming to your current EV, it's going to take a while to appear in any vehicles, assuming that it scales to the full battery level. However, it might be possible for people to build rigs to resurrect ailing batteries from out of warranty older EVs. So it looks like this is another one to add to the mountain of no EV batteries aren't going to die super quickly evidence. 
That's it for today. Thank you for watching and we'll be back with more soon. If you have questions about a news story that you want covered, go ahead and drop them in the comments or pop your question in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link below. If you like the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two. And give the bell a little tickle with your mouse to make sure that you are told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Jason Bodor, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tesla in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness and Denny Hyde, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Laura Reynolds, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Feeling left out, you can join Patreon at the link below or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links below. Thanks for joining me, and as always, Keep evolving.